we put the first things first. So we put the, place the things that are most important where they need to be. And we took some time last week talking about how, how above all else, we've got to put God first. Above our, above our accomplishments, above our, above our needs, above our, above our stuff, above our possessions, God is first. And, uh, and, and He is beyond. And the way that we, we draw near to Him is, is, is not through our good works. It's not through the good things that we do. It is simply by, by drawing near to Him. And I want to go a little deeper on that today as we talk about what it means to, to put God first by pursuing God. Pursue God. If we're going to put those things first, what does it look like to prioritize a life of prayer and connection and communion with God? And I, I've, I've got to believe today that for many of us in here, uh, prayer is one of those things that's at the top of the, of the priority list as we embark on a new year. Maybe as you're assessing your life and making some priorities or, or maybe tweaking some things and making some changes, maybe you've thought, you know, I should really, uh, this, this is going to be the year where I, I really take that time and set it apart and get alone with God. But can we just be real? Can we just be honest? That's, uh, that's one thing that we like to think about and, and talk about, but doing it is another thing, isn't it? Right? And can I just be real? As, as a pastor, you know, there, we, we get so full of, of life and, and doing many other things. And, and, and when, when prayer should be the first and foremost, we sometimes find ourselves thinking, wow, I just, I really haven't, I haven't spent that time with, with God the way I should. I feel that as a, as a pastor sometimes. I feel that, uh, 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 that, that, that longing to, to just sit alone and sit in that, in that quiet place and, and receive from the Lord. But there's so many other things that press around us, and I know that you feel them too. I had a student that, that was uh, someone I was mentoring uh, as a youth pastor some years back, and, and his name was Drew. And we would um, kind of walk around the church uh, at the end of a, of a Wednesday evening. I was kind of locking things up and turning off all the lights and and I just invited him to hang out with me, and, and uh, there was kind of a mentor relationship happening there. And he asked, he said, uh, he said what, I know you're a, a youth pastor, but he's like, what do you do all the time? What does that mean, you know, to, to, to be a youth pastor? And I start talking through some things, and, and, uh, and then he, he pauses, and he goes, wait a minute. I just, he goes, I just realized something. He goes, he goes you get paid to pray. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I guess, I don't know, That's, <laughs> you'll have to, you know, talk, talk, talk to the Lord about that. But, but uh, you know, we, whether, whether prayer is something that we do as part of a, <laughs> a calling or, 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 or where we work or what we do, it's, it's really a calling for, for every believer. It's a calling for every person. And it's, it's, it's important that we, we understand and that we, we understand what prayer is about and what, how to go about it. And sometimes the, our understanding of prayer is developed through our childhood. It's developed through, through what we watch or through what we learn. Maybe you could think back to some early memories as a child and what you witnessed and what you observed when it comes to prayer. I can remember vividly, you know, around the table, um, 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 mom and dad would, would lead us and would ask us to pray, and, and it was a very simple, simple prayer. I remember being in some friends' houses, and they would have, like, really cool prayers that they would, like, they practiced, and you could tell they did that over and over, and I'm like, whoa, that's, that's really neat. Ours was just like, dear Lord, thank you for this food, you know. It, it didn't seem really deep. I remember an image, I remember this, this picture uh, hanging in our kitchen dining area that my mom had placed there, and I didn't really understand it as a kid. I, I thought it was interesting, uh, but, but obviously he, we, it's, we see a man with his hands folded in prayer, and, and uh, honestly, as a kid, I looked at that, and I thought, wow, if you pray a lot, you get really gray hair, and you get you get some wrinkles, like prayer is hard work. I, I don't know, but, but if you understand anything about that painting, that was, that was, uh, uh, it was actually a photo that someone turned into an oil painting, uh, and it was, uh, it was a man who was praying over uh, something, thanking God for what he had in the midst of uh, a time when he didn't have very much, and it was just that, that daily bread image. What, what is it that shaped your view of prayer? Maybe it was you prayed you know, the, 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 the 23rd Psalm as a kid, the Lord is my shepherd. Maybe you prayed, now I lay me down to sleep. I'm not sure where that's at in the Bible, but uh, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Uh, maybe you prayed the Lord's Prayer as a child. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the prayers of kids, and, and it's always fun to, 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 see the, to see faith through the eyes of a child, and sometimes we get that glimpse through, 
through hearing them pray or hearing them explain God. And, and someone made a list of some prayers from kids that they had heard. And, and one, of, one, one child prayed. Uh, they, were, they wanted to give God some advice, evidently. And they prayed, Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel uh, would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms, right? So, so this child is trying to, you know, help the, the first uh, brothers to get along. Uh, they said, it works okay, it works out okay for me and my brother. So, you know, there, there you go, God. Another child prayed, dear God, um, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a good time where I'm at. So, <laughs> apparently, you know, someone wanted him to make some changes, and he's like, hey, this is, this is good. Dear God, one child prayed, I want to be just like my daddy when I grow up but without so much hair all over. So, you know, you, people say, you got to be specific when you pray, right? God, God hears specific prayers. Another child prayed, uh, please, please, God, send Devin Clark to another camp this summer. Um, so he was making some summer plans and didn't want his friend there. Um, another child had some concerns, very deep, deep concerns. They said, dear Jesus, please don't come back before the next Cars movie, okay? So the <laughs> there were some siblings um, that, that or, or, or some children praying, praying about siblings, and, and one of them prayed, Dear God, would you make me a little brother? I want somebody to boss around, okay? So how, how many believe that was a little girl that was praying, that was praying, that was a sister that was praying that prayer? This one was probably a boy. This boy prayed, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. So sometimes God says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says you don't get a puppy. I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, um, of my son Ethan. He was... Uh, Years ago, when they were in elementary school, I would take him and his sister. Often, if we had uh, about once a week, we'd try to go and have donuts with dad on the way to, to school. And, and at our local donut shop, you had different types of donuts that you could get, you know. There was like the $1 donut basic. There was a $2 donut, you know, that had a candy and, and different stuff on it. And then there were some really deluxe donuts. And evidently, I had been, uh, you know, skimping and, and just doing too many of the, the regular donuts. Because one day before we went out for donuts for dad, uh, my son literally, literally prayed this. He said, dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to, you know, uh, bless our day. He said, please help dad to buy us the $2 donut. <laughs> right? So how many of you know when your son prays that, the next time you're at the donut shop, um, you feel like maybe God is sending you, uh, sending a message. So, you know, $2 donuts. God cares about our prayer needs. God's word makes it clear that prayer is vital. Prayer is important. Prayer changes things. But uh, the frequency with which we pray or the time that we devote to prayer doesn't always match our belief in prayer. According to the Pew Research, Se Research Center, the majority of Americans they found pray every day, once a day. They found that 55% of those who they surveyed pray every day. The same study revealed that 75% of Americans pray at least once per month. Okay, so there's, there's prayer that's happening. But what does that, what does prayer, what does it actually mean to pray? What are we praying for? Who, who are we praying to? When and, and, and why are we praying? And as we think of these questions, it's it's important to look to God's word and, and, and ask the question, what, what does he have to say about prayer? Did Jesus say anything about prayer? Thankfully, he did. What we're going to realize uh, as we look in Matthew chapter 6 is that uh, prayer is not just for emergencies. It's not just for bringing a list of, of demands. It's, it's more about being changed by God than, than seeing change. Now, we know that God does bring about change, and Scripture is full of examples where people pray and change happen. But prayer is primarily about being changed in the presence of an almighty God. For some who, who pr place their faith in Christ, you, you might feel like prayer is a, a burden or, or a, this thing that, that you're, you're, you're kind of carrying or that, that, that is out there somewhere that you know you should do more of, but it's just, it's, it's like it's hard. It's, it's, it's like a chore. But prayer is not a chore. Prayer is not a burden. Prayer is an amazing gift. It's an amazing gift, and it's an amazing opportunity from God. And just like any good gift, we have to enjoy it. The, to, to enjoy the benefit, we've got to open that gift. We've got to receive and partake. And so as we were, as we were 
looking last week about how God is first before anything else, we, we unpacked Matthew 6, verse 33 a little bit, which says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And prayer fits right here, fits right here in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. God wants to bless and strengthen as we seek him through the avenue of prayer, through regularly talking, spending time with, having a conversation with God. And sometimes, and maybe you feel this way, you're like, I, who am I? Who am I that God would want to, to, to speak to me? What, look at where I've been. Look at what I've done. Look at, look at how I have messed up over and over. And can I, can I tell someone today, maybe you feel like you've, you've messed it up. Maybe you're watching online today and you feel like you have messed it up and God is, has, has, has eliminated you. You've been disqualified. You've been kicked off the island of prayer. God's saying no. No, it's, it's not about that at all. He is, he is seeking that regular commun communion, and it is up to us to pursue, to intentionally pursue, to put pursuit of God first on our priority list, to pursue him and his kingdom and all that he has. And so he's got a lot to say in his word about pursuing him in prayer. But we must be intentional, because something happens when we pray that, that quite literally doesn't happen if we don't. Like, that seems really basic, and that seems really, really fundamental, but, but something happens, and we don't always see it, do we? We don't always, always experience it, but there is something that's happening when we pray. And it may not be that God is changing something, a circumstance in our lives, but maybe he's wanting to change us. Prayer will change us, or it'll change the thing we're praying about, or maybe, maybe it will change both. And so I want to give us... Uh, as we pursue God, some, some, some things to, to uh, we'll call them some, some tools to put in the tool belt. And uh, I brought more props today, and some of you are saying, wow, it looks like your goal for the new year is to have as many props as possible uh, every weekend. And I can tell you that's not the goal, but I brought some props, and hopefully they'll help to, to drive home this idea. See, we've got this, this tool belt, and we've got, we've got these tools that God gives us. We, get, we have these opportunities that, that God presents in our lives, and, and maybe you're here today, and you've got this tool belt, and it's empty, and you're wondering, what, what can I do? How can I draw closer to God? Well, tool, well prayer is one of the most uh, amazing, powerful, it's, it's, it's the simplest form that God gives us to draw near to Him, and so I want to give us some things related to prayer to put in to that tool belt that will help us along the way. In, in Jesus' most fam famous and familiar teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, He's teaching the disciples what the kingdom is all about. And he's sharing wisdom and, and guidance, and he specifically addresses two areas, fasting and prayer. And much of the landscape, much of the religious landscape in Jesus' time was built on doing good things, doing good works, following strict rules. But Jesus knew that the way that the people lived, it mattered, right? It wasn't, it wasn't just it wasn't just what they did, but he also knew that why people live that way matters even more. He cuts to the core. He, he cuts to the heart. And so as we look at this idea, and we're, as, we're, as we're filling the tool belt, as we pursue God in prayer, what's first important is that we do it for the right reasons. When we pursue God in prayer, do it for the right reasons. In Matthew chapter 6, let's read there, starting in verse 5, Jesus says, When you pray, don't be like hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues or in the churches where everyone can see them. He says, I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on like some do. They, will, they think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Jesus said, don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. And He continues later in Matthew 6. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father who knows 
what you do in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Don't, don't miss that. He says that two times in two different ways. He says, your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. See, we take care of the obedience. We take care of the faithfulness. The Bible says that God will take care of the results. And some of us are too busy trying to take care of the results. Some of us are feeling like it falls on us that I've got to do this a certain way, that I've got to work harder, that I've got to try and be everything to everyone, that I've got to try and meet everyone's needs. And God is saying, stop. He's saying, stop and rely on me. And and right away here, Jesus says it's important that when we pray, it's for the right reasons, that the motives that our heart is right. When we pray and when we fast, it involves, it involves, in, with fasting, it involves giving up something in order to spend that focused prayer time with God. To be seen by others, to be seen by others fasting, to be seen by others praying, it goes against, it goes against God's design. It goes against the purpose. We, the purpose is to forget ourselves and to focus more on God. The purpose isn't to try and draw more attention to ourselves. Jesus, he bookends his, his, his Lord's prayer with, with examples, and, and he says that praying to impress others makes it, makes it more about us and not about God. And if we pray believing that if we just say the right words or if that we repeat them over and over that that's going to move God, then we begin to place our trust in ourselves more than God. There, there, there's not a formula, there, there's not a repetition that, that's going to move the heart of God. We don't pray to inform or convince or manipulate God. We pray out of obedience. We pray out of gratitude. We pray out of a, a desire to, to have communion with our Heavenly Father. We, we have gratitude to the access, for the access that God gives us because of Jesus. We call on that name of Jesus. And we can do that because of how much the Father loves us. That he sent Jesus and he says, I've given you access. So pursuing God, it requires the right motivations. It requires getting getting by yourself. And if if there's a tool that that might go along with this, maybe you need to to get something that's going to muffle out some of the noise, some of the the extra noise and and the voices and the influence. And maybe you need to to get alone and you need to get, like the word says, into that quiet place. Shut the door. Don't do it publicly, but quiet things out to be to hear from the Lord. It's about hearing from him and responding to him, listening to his spirit. The second thing to do when you pursue God is to bring your humility. Bring humility. Jesus continues in Matthew 6, and this is where he lays out what we know is the Lord's Prayer. And he said, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus is starting with this phrase, Our Father in heaven. And it's, a, it's, it's the place to start by recognizing first that it all starts with him. It's all for him. It's all about him. It's all because of him as we approach him in prayer. Our Father, and this word our indicates that we're a part of something. We're a part of his family. He is our Father. He is our Heavenly Father. He's not, it's not just about us, and it means that the, the, this, this Heavenly Father, uh, it, means, it, it means that we're coming to God. We're coming to the one who created and sustains everything. He loves and he wants to bless And as we pray in heaven, we're reminded that he is above it all. He's above it all, and he has, his perspective and his power are available to us. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble. As we approach God with humility, as we bring our humility, the Bible says that God gives grace and blessing to the humble. He doesn't give grace and blessing to those who think they have it all figured out, who think that they are doing God a favor by, by showing up to pray. No, it's, it's, it's about saying, God, I, wa- I approach you, Lord, humbly. I want your will to be done, your kingdom to come, your will be, to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It makes me think of, of a blueprint when we, need, when we need tools, when we're putting something together, we, we need a bl- blueprint. We need plans. And sometimes God is saying, would you stop and would you, would you get in tune with my plan? 
with his plan. His plan is God's word. It's his word to us. That's his plan. But so often we make our own plans. We have our own ideas. And God says, approach me in humility and follow my blueprint. God says, I have a way if you will walk in it, fully dependent. Prayer is an act. Prayer in and of itself is an act of humility. Prayer is acknowledging that, God, I, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I am dependent upon you. Jesus understood the importance. Jesus modeled it. Luke 5, 16 tells us Jesus withdrew to desolate places to pray. We see humility in that. We see that, that if Jesus needed it, we probably could use some of that as well, right? Bring your humility. Pursue God in prayer in a way that, that, is, that is submissive. The Bible says, blessed are the, are the meek. Jesus said it in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. There, there's a meekness. There's a humility. There's a posture that says, God, your will be done. I want your blueprint. I want to follow your plan, not my own. Bring humility when you come in prayer. The other thing that we can do as we pursue God in prayer is to bring hands that are open. Offer open hands. Offer open hands. Jesus said in verse 11 of Matthew 6, Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. The, 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 the next part of this prayer positions us to need God, to understand that we, everything we need is from God. Our daily provision, our forgiveness from sin, our freedom from temptation. Let's be real, we need it every day. And, and if, we, if we start to think we've got it figured out, if we, if we start to think, well, I've been doing this a while, I'm, I'm good to go, or, or if we think, well, I can, I can dabble a little bit over here and I'll still be good, we better be careful. We start thinking that way, and that's a, that's a dire warning sign that we are, that we are not walking in, in, in a way that acknowledges, God, I need you for everything every day. We start to think that we're able. We start to think that it happens in our own strength. Our greatest need is for our heart to, to be forgiven and freed, and we, we, don't, we can't do that for ourselves. And so we pray, as we pray, we, we should come to God with, with open hands and an open heart. We should say, God, prepare me. Prepare my hands. Prepare me for what, what you want to do. Lord, I receive what you have for me today. My hands are, my hands are open. My heart is open. God, I, I, I look to you for my provision. I, I look to you for, for freedom. Forgive me of my sin as I forgive others. Help me to walk in, in your will and according to your plan. We need, we need open hands. We pray primarily to, to be changed to be changed by our Heavenly Father, not just to see change. It's not, it's not about just bringing our list of needs and wants. The Bible tells us that we can bring those, but it's an opportunity to surrender, to make ourselves available for whatever God wants to do in us and through us. And we need it daily. Provision, forgiveness, freedom. We need to be ready to receive that forgiveness, but we also need to be ready to give it. We need to have hearts that are open. And, and I brought a, a big old pry bar to remind us that, that you know, God, open, let my heart be open. Do whatever you need to do, Lord, to, to have that access to my life. Let me not close things off. Let me not try and hide things. See, as we come to God in prayer, it's an opportunity to lay ourselves before him and ask God, is there something that I'm hiding? Are my hands closed? Is my heart closed? Am I, trying to, am I trying to get something by you? And the truth is, we know we can't get anything by God. We can't hide anything. We think we can. We get deceived into thinking that it's possible. But we really should be praying, God, take, take, take the, the pry bar of your Holy Spirit and pry my heart open. Help me to be open and to be ready to be available for what you want to do. When we pray with open hands, we acknowledge that we need his help every day. So when we pursue him, offer 
offer open hands. Offer an open heart. Maybe, maybe you even need to, to say, God, I, give me a, give me, I need a really good doorstop, Lord. Give me a really good doorstop, something that's really heavy that I can jam right in that door so that door my heart stays open, so that I stay available to what you want to do. And as we pursue God in prayer, as, as, as we pray prayers like, God, forgive me, I receive your forgiveness and help me to forgive those as I've, uh, to forgive those as you've forgiven me. We should be those who are seeking to restore. We're seeking to repair. He gives us the ability, he gives us the tool through prayer to restore. Pursuit of, of God requires not just an open heart, but also a forgiving heart. An open heart and a forgiving heart. And something, someone who wants to restore Someone, who, someone who's ready to fix things, right? We know that with duct tape, you can fix just about anything. God says, God says, get your duct tape ready. Get mend some relationships. Put some things back together. But too often what we want to do, sometimes what we do is we, we choose the sledgehammer of unforgiveness. And we're, we're, we're trying to destroy things. And we're trying to, now, now listen, is, is he, the, is he the, 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 the change maker and he's the one that helps us to break through? Does he break down strongholds? Absolutely. But unforgiveness is, is, is that stronghold that, that we need to do some repair work on. We need to, we need to look for ways to, to forgive as we have been forgiven, not to, not to destroy. Jesus says, forgive. Forgive our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. If we can't or won't forgive people who have sinned against us, what, what does that say about our relationship with God? What does that say about, about our walk with him? Jesus taught that, that those who have been forgiven much will love much. In Luke 7, 47, there was a, there was a sinful woman who came and, and she anointed Jesus and, 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 and she was wiping his, his uh, feet with her tears and with her hair. And, and Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, they have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. And, and, and those around him were asking, why, why are we allowed, do you know, if you knew who this sinful woman was, would you allow her to do this? And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 you're missing it, because she has been forgiven much. She understands the depth of, of the forgiveness from her heavenly Father. And so should we also understand that as we pray. So don't bring a, a sledgehammer where, where duct tape is needed. Forgiveness mends and it restores, but unforgiveness, it destroys and it breaks apart. And as we pursue God in prayer, we are, we are nudged toward forgiveness. We are reminded of how much we have been forgiven. And God says, as I have given to you, now freely give to others. Freely give it. I close with this. Prayer is the, is the means. It's, it's, it's the means by which we as followers, we, we humble ourselves and we invite God's presence into our lives. It's a way of humbling and inviting God's presence. It allows us to make room for receiving God in ways that, that can often be squeezed out by the world, by the things around us, by our decisions, by our, by our thinking. It's the, it's the longing for his presence. It's the longing to, to spend time with him that marks our relationship with him. Just like someone that you would have a close relationship with, you, you, there's a longing to spend time together, to talk together. Sometimes it's a really in-depth and really meaningful conversation that, that really helps and really provides guidance for your life. And sometimes... Sometimes you just sit there. Sometimes you're just present. That's how we come to the Lord as we pray. To pray is to invite his presence, and to invite his presence is to desire time with him. So when you take that step, when you say, God, I, I'm coming to you in humility, I'm coming to you with open hands, we're saying, God, I desire to, be, to have a life that is marked by, by you. Not, not to impress or manipulate, not to try and give appearances that, that I've got it all together. We do as Jesus taught his disciples do when we go away by ourselves to pray, when we, when we shut the door, when we go to God in that private place, when we, when we shut that door to the world, we're, we're opening the door to God's presence. 
We're opening that door to his presence and his power. And, and, and we may go there alone, but then we find that we're with him, that we're not alone. That we find that he's already there waiting for us. So what could it look like? What could it look like if you put, if you prioritize pursuing God in prayer? Think of what could happen in your life. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said this, Keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus said, I, I, I will open the door. Seek me. Now, now, sometimes we, we, the, the door opens and we realize that, that what I've been asking for isn't, that, that's not what God wants for me. He, ha, he, he, he has a different idea. His will, his purpose will prevail. But keep going. Keep pursuing Jesus. Keep pursuing Jesus. Let that be the prayer of our church in 2023, that, that if for nothing else, if nothing else, we're pursuing Jesus. When we come together and when we worship, we're pursuing Jesus. When we serve on a team, it's, it's to pursue Jesus. When we help out, when we, when we serve the mission, when we, whatever we do, we're pursuing Jesus because our faith, it grows. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible to please God. As we spend time in his presence, our faith grows. Let's grow our faith. Would you stand with me? Let's grow in this area of prayer. Let's, let's, let's allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. Let's go after the Father. Let's go after the Son. Let's go after the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Say, God, we need you. We need your presence. It was, it was once reserved for certain individuals. It was once reserved in the Old Testament for a physical location, a tabernacle. But then something happened in, in, in Acts, in the book of Acts, and, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come. And in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, God's presence showed up. And it's available. The Holy Spirit is available to us now today. It descended as they waited, and, and God still descends as people wait on him even now. He fulfills that promise that he made long ago. When we pursue God, we, we discover that, that what he's really offering us is himself. We don't, we don't pursue him just, just, just to get. We don't pursue him just so that we can say we, we checked that off of the list or, or we kept that streak going. No, we pursue him because it's, because it's him, because he's there. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's seek to understand by, by looking at his will, by saying, God, what is your will? Let's make our requests known. Let's, let's seek him. Hebrews eleven six 6 says it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So I want us to do that in these next few moments. We're going to sincerely seek him. We're going to sing that song again. We're going to call on the name of Jesus. And just make this, turn this into a, a moment of response to seek the Lord. If, if you need someone to, to pray with and you have a need, our prayer team will be avail available.